One autumn evening, Hamaguchi Gohei was looking down from the balcony of his house at some preparations for a merrymaking in the village below. There had been a very fine rice crop, and the peasants were going to celebrate their harvest by a dance in the court of the Ujigami. The old man could see the festival banners, nobori, fluttering above the roofs of the solitary street, the strings of paper lanterns festooned between bamboo poles, the decorations of the shrine, and the brightly colored gathering of the young people. He had nobody with him that evening but his little grandson, a lad of ten, the rest of the household having gone early to the village. He would have accompanied them had he not been feeling had he not been feeling less than strong than usual. The day had been oppressive, and in spite of a rising breeze, there was still in the air that sort of heavy heat which, according to the experience of the Japanese peasant, at certain seasons precedes an earthquake and presently an earthquake came. It was not strong enough to frighten anybody, but Hamaguchi, who had felt hundreds of shocks in his time, thought it was queer, a long, slow, spongy motion. Probably it was but the after-tremor of some immense seismic action very far away. The house crackled and rocked gently several times. Then all became still again. As the quaking ceased, Hamaguchi, Hamaguchi's keen old eyes were anxiously turned toward the village. It often happens that the attention of a person gazing fixedly at a particular spot or object is suddenly diverted by the sense of something not knowingly seen at all, by a mere vague feeling of the unfamiliar in that dim, dim outer circle of unconscious perception which lies beyond the field of clear vision. Thus it chanced that Hamaguchi became aware of something unusual in the offing. He rose to his feet and looked at the sea. It had darkened quite suddenly and was acting strangely. It seemed to be moving against the wind. It was running away from the land. Within a very little time, the whole village had noticed the phenomenon. Apparently, no one had felt the previous motion of the ground, but all were evidently astounded by the movement of the water. They were running to the beach, and even beyond the beach, to watch it. No such ebb had been witnessed on that coast within the memory of living man. Things never seen were unfamiliar spaces of ribbed sand, and reaches of weed-hung rock left bare, even as Hamaguchi gazed. And none of the people below appeared to guess what that monstrous ebb signified. Hamaguchi Gohei himself had never seen such a thing before, but he remembered things told him in his childhood by his father's father, and he knew all the traditions of the coast. He understood what the sea was going to do. Perhaps he thought of the time needed to send a message to the village, or to get the priests of the Buddhist temple on the hill to sound their big bell, but it would take very much longer to tell what he might have thought than to, it took him to think. He simply called to his grandson, Tada! Quick! Very quick! Light me a torch! Taimatsu, or ta pine torches, are kept in many coast dwellings for use on stormy nights, and also for use at certain Shinto festivals. The child kindled the torch at once, and the old man hurried with it to the fields, where hundreds of rice stalks, represented, representing most of his invested capital, stood awaiting transportation. Approaching those nearest the verge of the slope, he began to apply the torch to them, hurrying from one to another as quickly as his aged limbs could carry him. The sun-dried stalks caught like tinder. The strengthening sea breeze blew the blaze landward, and presently, rank after rank, the stacks, the stacks burst into flame. 
sending skyward columns of smoke that met and mingled into one enormous cloudy whirl. Tada, astonished and, astonished and terrified, ran after his grandfather, crying, Oji-san, why? Oji-san, why? But Hamaguchi did not answer. He had no time to explain. He was thinking only of the four hundred lives in peril. For a while the child stared wildly at the blazing rice, then burst into tears and ran back to the house, feeling sure that his grandfather had gone mad. Hamaguchi went on firing stack after stack till he had reached the limit of his field. Then he threw down his torch and waited. The acolyte of the hill temple, observing the blaze, set the big bell booming, and the people responded to the double appeal. Hamaguchi watched them hurrying in from the sands and over the beach and up from the village like a swarming of ants, and, to his anxious eyes, scarcely faster, for the moments seemed terribly long to him. The sun was going down. The wrinkled bed of the bay and the vast, sallow, speckled expanse beyond it lay naked to the last orange glow, and still the sea was fleeing toward the horizon. Really, however, Hamaguchi did not have very long to wait before the first party of succor arrived. A score of agile young peasants who wanted to attack the fire at once, but the Choja, holding out both arms, stopped them. Let it burn, lads, he commanded. Let it be. I want the whole Mura here. There is great danger. Tai Henda. The whole village was coming, and Hamaguchi counted. All the young men and boys were soon on the spot, and not a few of the more active women and girls. Then came most of the older folk, and mothers with babies at their backs, and even children, for children could help to pass water and the elders, too feeble to keep up with the first rush, could be seen well on their way up the steep ascent. The growing multitude, still knowing nothing, looked alternately in sorrowful wonder at the flaming fields and at the impressive face, impassive face of their Joja. And the sun went down. Grandfather is mad. I'm afraid of him, sobbed Tada in answer to a number of questions. He is mad. He set fire to the, house, the rice on purpose. I saw him do it. As for the rice, cried Yamaguchi, the child tells the truth. I set fire to the rice. Are all the people here? The kumicho and the heads of families looked about them and down the hill and made reply. All are here, or very soon will be. We cannot understand this thing. Shta! shouted the old man at the top of his voice, pointing to the open. Say now if I be mad. Through the twilight, eastward, all looked, and saw at the edge of the dusky horizon a long, dim line, like the shadowing of a coast where no coast ever was, a line that thickened as they gazed that broadened as a coastline broadens to the eyes of one approaching it, yet incomparably more quickly. For that long darkness was the returning sea, towering like a cliff, and coursing more swiftly than the kite flies. Tsunami! shrieked the people. And then all shrieks and all sounds and all power to hear sounds were annihilated by a nameless shock heavier than any thunder, as the colossal swell smote the shore with a weight that sent a shudder through all the hills, and a foam burst like a blaze of sheet lightning. Then, for an instant, nothing was visible but a storm of spray rushing up the slope like a cloud, and the people scattered back in panic from the mere menace of it. When they looked again, they saw a white horror of sea raving over the place of their home. It drew back, roaring, and tearing out the bowels of the land as it went. Twice, thrice, five times the sea struck and ebbed, but each time with lesser surges. Then it returned to its ancient bed and stayed, still raging, 
as after a typhoon. On the plateau for a time, there was no word spoken. All stared speechlessly at the desolation beneath. The ghastliness of hurled rock and navid riven cliff. The bewilderment of scooped up sea wrack and single shot over the empty site and of dwelling and temple. The village was not. The greater part of the fields were not. Even the terraces had ceased to exist. And of all the homes that had been about the bay, there remain, remained nothing recognizable except two straw roofs tossing madly in the offing. The after-terror of the death escaped and the stupefaction of the general loss kept all lips dumb until the voice of Hamaguchi was heard again, observing gently, That was why I set fire to the rice. He, their choja, now stood among them almost as poor as the poorest, for his wealth was gone. But he had saved four hundred lives by sacrifice. Little Tada ran to him and caught his hand, and asked forgiveness for having said naughty things. Whereupon the people woke up to the knowledge of why they were alive, and began to wonder at the simple, unselfish foresight that had saved them. And the headmen prostrated themselves in the dust before Hamaguchi Gohei, and the people after them. Then the old man wept a little, partly because he was happy, and partly because he was aged and weak, and had been sorely tried. My house remains, he said, as soon as he could find the words, automatically caressing Tada's brown cheeks, and there is room for many. Also, the temple on the hill stands, and there is shelter for the, there for the others. Then he led the way to his house, and the people cried and shouted, 